Last time we discussed the arms phenomenon and how it is expressed in people, as well as some tidbits on the league. So now concerning the sport itself, why did people start fighting with the arms ability as a sport, and what's with their superhero-esque get-ups? Well, to start off, the Fourth Arms Lab's confidential document reiterates that the arms ability is nothing new, but arms as a sport only dates back about 120 years. One particular attribute of the ability's nature had previously prevented competition, but that all changed thanks to the special masks invented by the arms ministry. This attribute that prevented competition is described in the seventh document of the confidential series, and it states that the issue of arms unraveling and changing shape without regard to their subject's will was solved by the invention of special masks, which allowed for sparring via extendable arms. As a result, formalized competitions quickly gain momentum. In the present day, these masks are provided to those with the arms ability free of charge, manufactured by Arms Labs and distributed by the Arms League. So the issue with the arms ability is that by itself, it actually turns the arms into tangled limp noodles that are virtually uncontrollable. The arms labs then developed a special kind of mask so that those affected by the arms ability could gain control of their arms and use them competitively in the arms league. The secret of the masks document tells us that if not rectified with a mask, the arms ability would actually make a person's arms coil and uncoil at random. Not very competitive at all. It should be noted that the Arms Labs and Arms League are two halves of a greater whole. The Ninth Confidential document mentions that the Arms Ministry named the new sport that was created around the unique extendable arm ability simply Arms. When the sport gained enough attention to sustain a professional league, the Ministry changed its name and split into two organizations. Tournament organization and fighter development would become the job of the Arms League, and foundational research on the Arms ability and the development of related products became the focus of Arms Labs. So going back to the tournament itself, how hard is it to get into the league? Well, according to what we know from the last video, most everyone who gets their arms ability decides to try out for a spot in the league. That number is unknown, but if 20% of even the country's population is anything to go by, that's a lot of applicants. But among those applicants, who are the ones accepted? According to the Dark Horse preview, only a measly 600. Then from that 600, only a single one is chosen to rise to the challenge and make it into the Grand Prix. Now. Where these applicants come from is unknown, but the comic does mention a spring gym in Springman's case, which usually means the one to rise out of the spring gym is the next spring man. So using that as the example, we can assume that there are various gyms that have their own set of applicants that then give the league their representative. Again, in the spring gym's case, this would be Springman, which is an apparently very prestigious title. So, who or what is a Springman? Firstly, the title of Springman seems to be one of the most important names in the Arms League. Yes, Springman is a character in the game, but as it turns out, he wasn't the only one who held that title, and he isn't the only one who entered into the Arms League with that name. The Dark Horse Arms preview issue opens with the question, what does it mean to be a Springman? An important question indeed. Let's look at the comic to find out more. We can see, presumably, a previous Springman on a poster hanging on our Springman's wall next to one of Max Brass and someone else. According to Springman himself, the Spring Gym is where the line of Spring Men came from. Every new generation, it seems a new one, trains in Spring Gym and takes up the mantle of Springman and joins the League. The comic refers to him as the everyman that every man wants to be implying the main draw to Springman is that he represents the common folk. It's also implied that the Spring Gym has never won a Grand Prix, as Springman states at the end of his speech that he won't rest until a championship belt hangs on the wall of the Spring Gym. This theory, though, is complicated by one thing. Max Brass is implied to have actually been a Springman in his early days. This is first hinted at through the poster on Springman's wall beside the most recent Springman, but also, if we take a look at the Arms Confidential Document number 9, we can see Max Brass sporting Springman's colors, as well as a sillier-looking version of the spring hat that he wears. 
Yes, the classic toothpaste hair Springman has is just a hat, not his real hair. So, if Max Brass was one of the early Springmen, then why was his name changed and why does Spring Jim not have a championship belt from Max Brass's victory? Well, we know he's the reigning champ, so Spring Jim must have at least one belt if Max Brass used to be Springman. There are two possible answers. The first possibility is that Max Brass changed his title after he won his first tournament, becoming Max Brass only once he had the championship belt in hand. Fans, though, had probably looked up to the name of Springman and what it meant for the competition. So after Max Brass changed his title and the mantle of Springman was vacant, the Spring Gym was founded, inspiring newcomers to be just like Max Brass, first starting out as Spring Men and working their way to the top. So technically, if this was the case, there was no Spring Gym when Max Brass won his first tournament as Spring Man, so all the glory was Max's. A second possible answer is that Spring Gym was founded before Max Brass was Spring Man, and the line in Spring Man's speech did not really mean that the gym had never seen victory, just merely that he intends to put one on the gym's wall, regardless of how many they already have. This is unlikely, I think. I think it's a safe assumption that Max Brass not only founded the Spring Gym after his first win as Springman, but also the title of Springman. Why would that mantle be so important otherwise? He, or at least an ancestor of his, was there in the early days of the Arms League, then called the Ministry. So we know he's an essential and iconic figure in the League. Just an interesting note here also, the comic seems to back up the fact that Max was the first Springman. Then the green-haired Springman came after him, and then finally the Springman we see in-game. When Springman gets a call from the League calling him number three, it either means he placed third among the applicants, unlikely, since the League only accepts a single champion among the applicants, or more likely, he is the third Springman to grace the League. Considering we've only been given one other Springman in the comic, and Max is dressed as Springman in the early photos of him, we can assume that that indeed is how the line goes so far. In any case, enough about Springman, the Spring Gym, and the Arms League. Let's talk about the Arms Labs. Last episode I left us off with quite the cliffhanger. The classified documents speak of a Dr. C, and she apparently is the head of the labs, known for developing the mask technology that allows fighters to control their arms as well as numerous more secretive projects. Most of you who have played the game since last year probably already know that Dr. C is referring to Dr. Coyle, a character we eventually got to play as in a free DLC drop. Now this character looks anything but benevolent. Her whole shtick is the mad scientist, always looking for her next breakthrough by doing some pretty unethical stuff. This is mostly true, as the confidential documents give us ample evidence to believe everything she's done has been purposeful and malicious. Though Coyle is responsible for most, if not all, the technology you see in-game, she's also worked in the shadows to research some pretty ethically ambiguous stuff. For example, there have been reports that Arms Labs agents would actually break into the homes of popular arms champions in order to question them, or study their ability without their consent. Twintel had Arms Labs agents follow her in secret, and some even infiltrated one of her film sets to steal a fallen strand of her hair. They did this because Twintel was a case study particularly fascinating, since the arms ability manifested in her hair, not the arms as is normal. Kid Cobra was shadowed by arms agents because he was one of the few people that was actually born with the ability. The discovery of how the optical faculties controlled the arms ability couldn't have been mere hypothesis either. There must have been some way they were able to prove that phenomenon and design masks around it. You can imagine the process for this investigation was a little less than innocent. I suppose I can't quite talk about weird experiments without mentioning Headlock. Headlock, as you know, is the final boss of the Grand Prix and Coyle's magnum opus. There's a lot of very interesting lore here. Headlock was an idea that Coyle had before the events of the game. She created him with the help of her fellow scientists and her goo bots. At first, Headlock was intended to be a wearable device that would clamp around the user's torso, a concept that was scrapped quickly as it was discovered that arms are not controlled by the torso but the eyes and brain working in tandem. But she did go pretty far with that idea, to the degree of making a prototype. Matter of fact, you can see this prototype in the background of the lab's stage. The original idea was that the device was going to serve as a sparring partner, since the arms would be partly controlled by an artificial intelligence. So naturally they began work on a new headlock model, one that clamps to the head instead of the torso. Theoretically, it could be controlled by the wearer. 
Unfortunately, we know that this backfired pretty quickly. The leftover AI that Coil developed ended up taking precedence over the human mind, so when the user wore Headlock, their minds were overridden and controlled by Headlock instead of the other way around. This ended up in catastrophe. Headlock broke free of the Arms Lab's facility and escaped by blasting his way out of a wall. Chronologically, right after this is the events of the final battle in Grand Prix mode. We can tell since Biff mentions reports of an escaped Arms Lab's project after Headlock is defeated. Dr. Coyle, however, was not worried. This was her plan all along. But one has to ask, why? Why would Coyle purposefully release Headlock into the Grand Prix to fight Arms participants? Well, as our documents tell us, Coyle was the youngest person in history to rise to the top of Arms Labs as their head. That same document also tells us that she may possess 52 doctorates and the inability to taste food. But that's irrelevant. Anyway, we know from her immense success in the lab she aims to be the one topping leadership. Well, we know that Headlock eventually got to prove his worth as a punching bag for all the ARMS participants, and that Coyle was perfectly okay with the events that transpired at the end of every Grand Prix. We also know she was studying every single fighter that participated, down to her own creations, DNA Man and Springtron. What can be surmised from this is that she wishes to be at the top of the Grand Prix herself, and Headlock fighting every tournament winner is her method of gathering data. What's more is that another document speaks of her beginning development on a new Headlock model that could be easily equipped and unequipped at the user's discretion. When we see Coil finally make her entrance in the Grand Prix as the true final boss, she willingly puts it on and takes off Headlock during the final fight. Coil is an incredible egomaniac, and her drive to be smarter, stronger, and generally better than everyone else is pretty evident, especially in her Grand Prix mode. In her journal, she specifically calls out Mechanica and Ninjara for being less intelligent than she is, calling Mechanica's suit amateur, and telling Ninjara to expect to receive a failing grade. Coyle's ego and drive to be at the top of the Arms League was not always so loud, though. We know that a certain person was partially responsible for the woman she turned into. Just like the Arms Ministry used to be a united form of the Arms League and Labs put together, Coyle and Max Brass, the leaders of the Arms Labs and League respectively, used to be in a relationship of some form. We can assume romantic. I doubt Coyle would be affected as badly if it was just a friend thing. This relationship was a good one, too, if the picture of them in their early days is anything to go by. Coyle actually looks approachable here. Now, allow me a bit of speculation, since we don't have much to go off here, and Coyle doesn't divulge too much on her relationship with him. Her journal does give some additional detail. It says, The things he said to me, I can never forgive. His day of reckoning will come. Oh, it will come. And that's about it. So, Max and Coyle had some major disagreement, it seems. When she fights Max Brass while he's headlocked, Biff wonders if this is all because of something he did to her. He tells her to put her past behind her and help him out. Of course, we know her only goal is to make a spectacle of Max Brass's defeat and be the best. When she refuses defeat and puts on headlock in order to win, Biff says, Dr. Coyle's refusing to admit defeat. I've got a bad feeling about this, people. I always knew the Doc's devotion to arms was a little creepy, but she's totally obsessed. Her pet projects, Helix, Headlock, Springtron, the Party Crash program, were all a part of her research. But research for what? To become the ultimate arms champion, even if she has to use Headlock to do it? This pretty much sums it up. Coyle is incredibly adept intellectually. She used to be in a relationship with Max Brass, but their fundamental differences separated them, and she grew vengeful at something he did. She drove herself to the top of the arms labs and began research on various unethical projects in order that she, now the rad scientist Dr. Coyle, could steal the championship title from Max and prove to the world that she is officially better than everyone. Good? Good. I haven't even gotten into her creations all that much yet, but I think we'll leave it at that for now and get into the nitty gritty with individual fighters in the following episodes. Next time, we'll try to cover Springtron, Helix, Master Mummy, and maybe some more Max Brass? We'll see. Hope you guys enjoyed this arms lore episode, and I'll see you soon.